well, this video has been a long time coming. My renewed interest in Star Wars and its extended universe is well documented on the channel, as is my extreme love for Western RPGs. So it was inevitable that these two pursuits came together, and I covered one of the most well-loved Star Wars games of all time, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Knights of the Old Republic, commonly known as KOTOR, was originally released on the Microsoft Xbox in July of 2003, with a Windows PC release that came a few months later. It released to immediate and universal acclaim, with a Metacritic score of 93. The years passing haven't diminished the reverence publications have bestowed upon it either. IGN featured KOTOR relatively highly both in its top games of the decade list for the decade it came out, as well as the number 27 spot in its top 100 games of all time list. Needless to say, I was extremely excited to have the chance to revisit this classic, a game that I love dearly and have an immense amount of respect for. I just finished clocking around 35 hours over the past two weeks, which was enough to play through the critical path once, while doing a reasonable amount of the side content. And in that time, there are a lot of aspects of this game that really stuck out, most for better and some for worse. But before we dive into the game itself, let's lay out some context. It is the year 2000. Bioware was a prominent RPG company, with two years having passed since the release of its breakthrough computer RPG Baldur's Gate and its highly anticipated sequel soon to be released. Bioware announced their partnership with LucasArts, confirming that they were working on a Star Wars game for the then-upcoming console generation and PC. Before a title of the game was given, Lucas gave Bioware a choice. They could either make a game based on Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, or they could go back in time thousands of years and make a game in a period that was only briefly referenced throughout the fiction. This period in time is known as the Old Republic, and the title of the game makes it abundantly clear which option was chosen, and hindsight makes it stupidly obvious that this was the right choice. Going to the Old Republic setting allowed Bioware to make use of the Star Wars brand, but not be tied to its baggage. They didn't have to warp a story around the events that were occurring in the movies, they didn't need to find a way to cameo or involve Anakin within the plot of the game. The Old Republic setting allowed them to cherry-pick the Star Wars fiction for things they wanted to use and ignore things they didn't. There are lightsabers, there is the Force, there are Jedi, and there are Sith, but you won't find the Millennium Falcon or Stormtroopers or Yoda or Darth Vader here. Well, at least not literally. KOTOR admittedly plays it a little safe in that regard by ensuring that most prominent aspects of the Star Wars fiction get some sort of equivalent here in the Old Republic setting. Also borrowed from the original trilogy is KOTOR's primary motif. It is a story of good and evil, but more importantly, evil can always be redeemed and nobody is undeserving of a second chance. These subjects being so closely aligned with the original trilogy keep KOTOR fearing thematically very Star Wars-y. For better or worse, it easily feels like something George Lucas himself could have written. And I think for the first entry in a big budget ambitious RPG on the next generation of console, it made sense to play it safe in some aspects. Thankfully, it more than makes up for this safety with some daring choices in other areas of the game. The first thing you do upon starting a new game is create your character. You pick from a few preset models, allocate your stat points, pick which skills you want, and then you are greeted with the traditional Star Wars title crawl. This opening informs you of a galaxy in turmoil. Darth Malak, the apprentice of the recently defeated Sith Master Darth Revan, is waging war on the Republic with his Sith fleet. The Jedi Knight who led the Strike Force to defeat Revan, Bastila, has since tried to flee Malak's clutches. Malak's forces were striking back on a Republic ship that she and some other Republic soldiers were stationed on. After many casualties, she escaped the ship via escape pod and landed on the planet below, Karis. As one of the last surviving Republic soldiers on that ship, alongside veteran soldier Carthonassi, you take the last escape pod and follow Basila to the surface in an attempt to ensure her safety and return her to the Republic. And so begins your objective on the first of many planets you will experience in this game, and it leads me to one of the coolest risks I think Bioware took. This entire planet, alongside the first half of the planet to follow, you are not a Jedi, and you don't get a lightsaber. Instead, you are a common soldier and need to fight with blasters or actual swords for this planet's duration. This isn't a small tutorial planet by any means either. Taris is one of the most content-rich planets in the game, and I spent around 8 hours there on this playthrough. If you'll allow me to sidetrack real quick with my hot take, 
I think Taris is extremely underrated. Lots of discussion that I see around KOTOR usually comes alongside mention of Taris being the most boring, slow, or worst planet. I cannot agree. I love Taris. It has a lot going on with multiple story arcs within the Bastila rescue mission. You'll need to learn about the ongoing Sith occupation and their bigotry against aliens, scour multiple cantinas, and engage in non-lethal arena battles. You'll brush up against the criminal underworld, you'll brush up against the literal underworld, take sides in a gang war, do a swoop race to win Bastila's freedom, all finally ending with Malak's wrathful decision to bomb the entire planet into submission. I think Taris gets a bad rap for two reasons. First, because it lacks the movie iconicness of a planet like Tatooine or the historical significance like the Sith homeworld of Korriban. And secondly, because it's the barrier between you and your lightsaber. I have to imagine that people really blitz through this pace at mock speed so they can get their Jedi weapon and force powers, seeing Taris as an obstacle because of this. I'm not projecting, either. That was my opinion back when I played this game as a 5th grader. I can't be the only one. Taris is awesome, hot takeover, back to my original point. Forcing you to play through 20% of this game without a lightsaber gives greater appreciation of what that weapon actually means. A lightsaber isn't given, it's earned. The second planet of Dantooine serves as a peaceful enclave of Jedi. Being accepted into their order and wielding their signature weapon requires you to undergo tasks to prove your worthiness. Not just tasks that prove your combat medal, but tasks involving you learning and reciting the code of the Jedi Order. Your ultimate task is to collect the components of a lightsaber and put them together, constructing your own weapon. And when you finally do this and snap that lightsaber on, you know you've just gotten your hands on a game changer. Finally, getting that lightsaber is a reward that feels incredibly well earned, and the more you learn about the Jedi Order in the process of doing so, gives so much more context to this world. And this world itself is one of the greatest appeals here. More than just being a new setting in the Star Wars fiction, it's a new setting that feels remarkably real. Bioware put lots of detail into the world that gives the impression it's a world that would exist with or without you. A world whose gears would be turning, even if you stopped playing. Take the ocean planet of Manan for instance. It's rich with a natural resource known as Kulto, a substance whose quick healing properties make it incredibly sought after during times of war. The locals attempt to sell to both sides of the galactic conflict in order to maximize their profit, and they enforce strict neutrality to ensure it stays that way. Being an ambassador of the Republic on this planet doesn't give you any preferential treatment, and should you take any actions that would harm the sources of Kulto, then you'll be put on trial. Manan has a realized judiciary system complete with judges and lawyers, and your actions during this trial may determine whether or not you'll ever get to set foot on this planet again. You can talk about almost any of the planets in this game to the same degree, and this richness in its setting is part of what makes walking around and soaking in KOTOR's wonderful vistas. The entire game is also completely voiced, which has sort of become the standard for big budget RPGs of today, but at the time, the amount of dialogue that needed recording to make KOTOR work was pretty mind blowing. They even have a set of lines for most of the alien races you run into, giving just one more bit of texture to the realness of this world. Bioware doesn't stop at fleshing out the then and now of this world. It adds depth to the history that this world has had. I'll need to get into spoiler territory to talk about what I mean. I'll annotate something on screen so you can skip the spoilers if you haven't played. Knights of the Old Republic leans into some sci-fi by giving the Star Wars fiction an elder race, a precursor civilization. Over 20,000 years before the events of the game, an alien race known as the Rakata ruled the galaxy with an iron fist in what became known as the Rakata Infinite Empire. They were far more technologically advanced than other races at the time, allowing them to enslave over a trillion people. They conquered and expanded their influence until eventually, they became too drunk on their own power and hubris. Civil War split the Rakata into many sub-factions until they tore themselves to pieces. What remains of their race millennia later now almost exclusively live on their home planet. Clipped of their wings and lacking the advanced technology they once had, the Rakata reverted to something a lot more primal. They attack outsiders on sight and fight with swords instead of blasters. Despite all they've lost, they continue to war amongst themselves. Most of this gets revealed to you towards the end of the game as you make it to the Rakata home planet but their significance can be felt along the way. 
what led you to this planet was an attempt to recreate the footsteps of Revan and Malak and find out what they were up to. In the time preceding the game's opening, the Sith Lords were attempting to find an ancient Rakata weapon known as the Star Forge, and they did so by finding multiple ancient star maps the Rakata left behind. Putting all of these maps together gives you the necessary coordinates to get the now unnamed Rakata homeworld and thus the Star Forge. The whole precursor civilization thing is a trope that a lot of major sci-fi and fantasy properties have done before. Bioware themselves had the progenitor races play a key role in Neverwinter Nights, and repeated it in Mass Effect with the Protheans. Despite this trope being one that's not entirely unique, I love a world with history. And if I'm being completely honest, I fall hook, line, and sinker for the Elder Race thing every time, no matter how often I see it. While we're on the topic of spoilers, I should probably cover that shouldn't I? Knights of the Old Republic story has one of the strongest twists of all time. You, the player character, are the Sith Lord Darth Revan. The strike force led by Basila preceding the events of this game defeated Revan, but didn't destroy him. The Jedi Code forbids killing. Instead, Basila returned an injured and dying Revan back to the Jedi Council, where his mind was wiped and the Council turned him against the Sith. It's a moment that strikes hard, and it feels earned due to how well telegraphed it is. Despite me being taken completely off guard the first time I heard the twist, the seeds are most definitely planted. Frequently recurring dreams that you and Bastila have throughout the game of her defeating Revan get dismissed by Bastila as a force bond that you share. But if you pay attention closely, these dreams are primarily from the perspective of Revan portraying Bastila as an aggressor. Couple that with the fact that nearly every Force-sensitive character you come across remarks about how insanely strong in the Force you are despite your minimal training might have given you some clues as to your character having a history in the Force. Though I think I hand waved that away as being main character syndrome my first time around. The reveal of Darth Revan being the main character is the closest Star Wars has ever gotten to another I am your father moment, and that alone makes the game worthwhile. Replaying the game while knowing about the twist does sap away some of the fun. A lot of this game is built around that twist being effective. Without that twist, the story itself is a straightforward fight of good versus evil, which is super on brand, but also a lot less in depth than what's found in Knights of the Old Republic 2. But I'll get there in the next video. The last component of this story worth mentioning is the characters, which for the most part I liked. Hero of the Republic Karth and Jedi Bastila are definitely the most fleshed out of your potential party members, and they certainly have the most significance to the core narrative. Karth is plagued by guilt due to his inability to save his family from a massacre at the hands of the Sith. His former mentor and a man he once respected is now seduced by the unrestricted power Darth Malak gives him by allowing him to control the Sith Armada. Karth's patriotism and oath to the Republic are why he fights, but deep down at least a small part of him is driven by revenge, and whether or not you'll let him make good on that revenge is a late game choice you'll have to make. Likewise, Bastila herself turns to the dark side once Malak gives her a taste of how strong she could be. Towards the climax of the game, she will confront you with her now red lightsaber and challenge you to a duel. Once again, you will be forced to make a meaningful decision on whether or not you want to attempt to turn her back to the light, strike her down, or rule the galaxy with her by turning to the Sith. All of the characters have some sort of character moment and quest line, but none are quite as large or meaningful as Karth's or Bastila's, and it's why I consider them, alongside Revan, the main characters of this game. The rest of the party can kind of fall to the background at points, and if you want an example, let me share with you my experience with Zalbar on this playthrough. Zalbar is a Wookiee and lifelong best friend of Mission, another party member. When I returned to his home planet of Kashyyyk, he was forced to confront his brother, the now chieftain of his people. Zalbar is taken prisoner by his brother until you complete a quest for the chieftain. This quest is optional, so I thought I would see what would happen if I completely ignored it. I was able to both leave the planet and complete the game without saving Zalbar. That alone isn't a red flag. In fact, I think being able to beat the game while taking this line is a bit of player freedom. Not every character needs to have an integral role in the destruction of the Star Forge. What was weird is that his lifelong best friend did not protest my inaction at any point beyond her having a few lines when we took the quest. I even talked to her on the next planet and there weren't any dialogue options to discuss him. Maybe there's something I'm missing, but it feels weird how this wasn't a bigger deal among my party members. 
Small gripes aside, this story and world deliver. The galaxy is extremely lived in with its own politics and languages and history. There's a strong late game twist that left my jaw on the floor the first time I experienced it. And the characters that get enough attention have some interesting stories going on. And that brings me to just about the only part of Knights of the Old Republic that I disliked. Playing it. Okay, that's probably a little harsh, and this is the part of the script where you're going to need to keep my individual tastes in mind. I'm not a big fan of real-time with pause combat in the first place, and I think KOTOR might be my least favorite implementation of the system in a big budget game. KOTOR suffers from 2000's RPG syndrome. I talked about this a bit in my Witcher 1 review, but I feel like KOTOR comes from a transitional era in RPG history where the average gameplay was at its worst. Compare KOTOR to what Bioware made before it, isometric CRPGs like Baldur's Gate. Then compare it to what came after, something like Mass Effect. The former is an attempt to digitize the rule set of Dungeons and & Dragons, and the latter is far closer to an action game with its RPG aspects being more prominent in the story than in the gameplay. KOTOR feels like an ungratifying middle ground between both of these systems. The behind-the-back movement allowing you to control with WASD makes it look and feel a bit more like Mass Effect, but the auto-attack driven MMO-like combat system means that your button presses are merely queuing up commands, not executing them. As gratifying as it should be to summon lightning from your hands and zap multiple enemies at a time, clicking your force lightning ability means that you'll fire it off in a second or two, depending on how the queue is doing. It doesn't feel good. I would argue that most of the proper CRPGs like Baldur's Gate suffer from this problem too, but at least for all of their clunkiness, there's strategy waiting for you if you overcome that, with a wide set of character types and skills and positions you can put your team into. In Knights of the Old Republic, my most optimal play always felt like it was spamming my most powerful move over and over again. Moves aren't gated by cooldowns here, so for any non-force abilities you can spam indefinitely, and any force abilities you can spam till you're out of energy. It leads to some seriously repetitive play patterns. My builds always end up roughly the same every time I play too. I think there are less useful skills on the ability tree than there are points given to you. Without cooldowns, a lot of these attacks become redundant. Why would you ever invest in an ability that's a flurry of attacks and an ability that's a single large attack? Depending on your stats, one of these will be superior to the other on average, and you should always be spamming that one. If cooldowns were in place, you would at least have a reason to occasionally fall back on a sub-optimal option. There are other weird aspects of the gameplay that hamper the experience too. The party chatter that occurs in a lot of other Bioware games doesn't just idly happen as you explore the world, but here it completely stops you from doing what you're doing so you can watch the dialogue between the characters. The auto-follow function on your party members messes up a lot too with characters frequently getting caught on NPCs or terrain when attempting to follow you. Couple that with frequent load screens that don't let you pass them unless all of your party is nearby means that you'll frequently be needing to gather your party before venturing forth. There's a reason that nobody out there is trying to emulate the style of the gameplay in these games. There's a reason that nobody has championed a Kickstarter that'll be the spiritual successor to the Knights of the Old Republic combat system. It's clunky, there's more complexity than there is depth, and for me, it'll always be the thing I do in between the real game, which is talking to NPCs and experiencing this world. And I think that just goes to show how incredible this game truly is. I still love it and spent around 20 minutes singing its praises, despite me not actually liking the gameplay, in a video game. And that's part of why I think KOTOR is one of the best candidates for a potential remaster. Take this setting and characters and story, give it a graphical overhaul, then slap literally any other combat system on top of it, and I would be $60 poorer. So it's 2020. Knights of the Old Republic has been out for nearing on two decades now, and it's clear that some aspects of it have held up a lot better than others. So why play it? Why replay it? The reasons for jumping into KOTOR are exactly the same reasons you should watch the Star Wars movies, or read the Star Wars books. Bioware did what Lucas did in 1977 and again in 1999. They didn't just create a new world, they created a new galaxy.